Now, on the, that long fifth chapter of Alma, in the 53rd in the 53rd verse, he gets specific on something. You notice in verses 40 to 43 there, he talks in general terms about evil and good. Whatsoever is good cometh of God, whatsoever is evil cometh of the devil. Well, what are you talking about? I speak with the energy of my soul and so forth. Here he's specific, you see. He tells what he's talking about in 53, you see. Can you lay aside these things and try to trample the Holy One under your feet? Can you be puffed up to the pride of your heart? Now, this is what he talks about specifically when he says being evil, you see. Yea, will you still persist in wearing costly apparel, settling, setting your hearts on the vain things of the world upon your riches? I've always been taken up with costly apparel. It's so much in the Book of Mormon. I read it since I was a little kid, so I loathe the costly apparel. I get all my duds at Deseret, you know. This, all this outfit comes from Deseret Industry, except that I have kids that make me wear other things occasionally. They'd sooner be found dead in the back lot than shopping at Deseret Industries. <laughs> I don't know why, as far as that goes. The only thing wrong with these are uh, the landings sometimes fall out and the zippers misbehave, things like that. But, uh, no, why not? I mean, when you get this for four bucks and the pants for three, can't beat it. But you're not supposed to wear costly apparel. Uh, and setting your heart on the vain things of the world upon your riches, in short. It summarizes all that. There. Here we are again at this theme. And the next verse, of course, is equality again. Will you persist in supposing that you're better one than another? And then you see, get a reflection of this persistent tension. As long as Alma around, you're going to get this tension. You notice that. Uh, this tension, this extreme contrast. Will you persist in persecution of your brethren who humble themselves, who walk after the holy order of God, wherewith they have been brought into the church, have been sanctified by the holy day to bring forth works and so on? Two totally different worlds we have here, as we mentioned before. And will you persist in turning your backs upon the poor and the needy and withholding your substance? Again, this distribution of wealth business. Well, they are they who shall be hewn down and cast into the fire, except they speedily repent. It's not a stable situation at all. And we are yet, uh, well, here. Come ye out, be separated, touch not the unclean things. He wants to keep them separate. We're, we haven't come out, of course, in our society anymore. We used to, the saints and got into trouble doing it. They don't do it anymore. The names of the wicked shall not be mingled with the names of my people. When one is called, as many are called, uh, well, we might say to a high office or something else, what kind of an invitation is it? When you're called to any calling, any office or anything else, it's an invitation to change your ways completely. And do we take it completely? Uh, we do for a while as missionaries, they will, and then they go completely back again. Interesting case about that. We have to get on here. Notice he's talking about being sanctified, being hagios, being set apart, being sigilla, people sealed and set apart. The names of the righteous, remember he's still talking in terms of the rites of atonement here. In the book of life, the inheritance to my right hand, part of the right, of course, as we mentioned before, everyone is registered in the book at that time. And if your name is not registered in the book, you are out of the kingdom for three years. That's all there is to it. You have no rights, whatever. You're outlawed. Well, <clears throat> and then he compares them with sheep. Sheep in the New World, well, sheep is like silk. If you look it up, dictionaries and so forth, sheep refers to any brand of, well, there are dozens, scores of uh, varieties of sheep, as you know. Some no more resemble sheep than uh, and more resemble sheep than others do. Where do you have the difference between sheep and, and the rams and so forth? Or, or the, the llamas or the vicunias or anything like that. They're all classified by the sheep, uh, grazing animals. The Egyptians have just one word for them, the yiver. That's it. The short horned, as against the long horned animals, and that's it. They use one word, and it goes for, for sheep, for rams, for goats, for gazelles. For, well, no, gazelles have longer horns. But if a short horned animal, wild or not, I guess, I guess a stain boat would be a sheep with them. But anyway, it's one of those generic terms. He commandeth that ye suffer no ravenous wolf to enter among you. So you notice the ravenous wolf, which means acquisitive, greedy, predatory, exploitative, the ravenous wolves. We talk a lot about greed today front pages of journals and everything else. Uh, Wall Street Journal, Time, and the rest of them always talking about, uh, always talking about the greed and so forth. Well, would you admit the wolf? Uh, what would admit it would be that? I command you to belong to the church. He can command those to belong to the church. The others he simply invites, as he says here. The covenant people not only separate themselves from the world, 
they're necessarily bound and they're commanded here. I, I speak by way of commandment to you who belong to the church and to those who don't belong to the church I speak an invitation. Of course we, we invite, invite the world to enter the covenants which we are commanded to obey. Or do we follow the lead of the corporate world? Well, now we come to the sixth chapter, which is a very short chapter, which simply implements just what he has said. See, this is how he went about doing it. He says, Alma, he ordained priests and elders. He went about setting up the official uh, structure of the church, the ordinances and the priesthood. And he had the people and the rites. The people who repented were baptized, duly baptized. And notice, he was a cleansing of the church. He's straightening things out. If people wanted to join and repented, then they were baptized. On the other hand, members who had been members all their life who did, who did belong to the church, if they didn't repent, they were cut off. See, he's straightening things out again. He's got Alma strict as ever, you see. Whoever did not belong to the church, he was cut off. He was rejected. Notice, did not repent of their wickedness and humble themselves. I mean those who were lifted up in the pride of their hearts, the same were rejected. They were not in the records. And their names were blotted out, taken out of the record that the names were not among, uh, numbered among those of the righteous. So they took repentance repenters in and they threw non-repenters out. And so he began to establish the order of the church in Zarahemla. That's what it's about. That's how you set up the, you implement what you've done. And the usual uh, routine is followed. Of course, the, the law of the gospel is followed here. Notice they're supposed commanded to gather themselves together often and join in fasting and prayer on behalf of the welfare of the souls of those who knew not God. So they hold their meetings and their fasts as well as their ordinances. And then Alma, having set things up here, he said he departed to the city of Gideon. And uh, so he comes to a neighboring city and is going to do the same thing there. And he starts out by telling the people of, of Gideon in chapter 7 here, so we're going to move along, uh, I attempt to address you in my language, which shows that they were speaking dialects. Well, dialects very easily spring up, as I say, and these people had been here hundreds of years, and these out-settlements out had become quite aloof, and you can be sure they had different, as I say, after all, you have your 12 Hopi dwarfs, uh, visual, dwarfs <laughs> villages, and they're close together in the range of 60 miles, and uh, each one has a separate dialect. You can recognize one from one village or another. It, that's the way it happens. And so I attempt to address you in my language. He says, I've given up everything else. I gave up the judgment seat. It's been given to another. I've done that deliberately so that I could come and preach to you, he says. The, then he says to them, Zarahemla, he's left Zarahemla, all right. He's pleased with them. And uh, my joy cometh over them after waiting through much affliction and sorrow. Now I trust it's going as well with you, he says. And notice the sixth verse. I trust that ye are not in such a state of unbelief as were your brethren that Zarahemli had to work with. These prime evil, and then what do you mean? What is the state of unbelief? What's the wickedness? Back to the old song again. Set your hearts on riches and the vain things of the world. Yea, I trust you do not worship idols, but that you worship the true and living God, and that you look forward for a remission of your sins with an everlasting faith which is to come. See, if you're saved, you're looking forward to a remission of your sins. You haven't got it yet. You have it remitted, but uh, as long as we're in this earth, is in this world, you see, as long as we're here, we're under the troubles of our proud and angry dust are from eternity. They won't fail here. Unbelief necessarily leads to setting one's hearts on riches and uh, since you must put your trust in something. Satan's doctrine, of course, you put your trust in them. These things all go together. But we're not in the clear here. Uh, one's sins have not yet been remitted, as we learned in Second Nephi uh, 2 and 21, where he tells us that right up to the day of our life, we must repent, he says. That's why our lives have been extended, so it gives a better opportunity. Then he says an interesting thing. He talks about the Lord is going to come. Prepare the way for the Lord. He's going to be born of Mary at Jerusalem in the land of our forefathers, she being a virgin. He talks familiarly as if they already knew about Mary. Well, Mary, Mary Atu, Imra Atun, uh, or Mar Atun, Mar Atun means uh, a human being, but it means a woman. It's the regular Mary and Martha, both the same word, and they both mean woman. You should be born of a woman, a Maria at, uh, Mary at uh, Jerusalem. Will be born of Imratu, of a Mary, at, or of Miriam at Jerusalem. They're all, I say, they're all just the words for woman, as far as that goes. She'll be born of, of Mary, which is in the land of our forefathers, she being a virgin, a precious chosen vessel, a special woman. Well, she'll be born, her name is Mary, uh, 
he gives them the benefit of that at any rate. But they shouldn't be surprised at that, as far as that goes. Uh, and again, this has been a great, uh, uh, a great charge against Book of Mormon, you see. Born at Jerusalem, he was born in Bethlehem. He wasn't born in Jerusalem, was he? Aha, aha. Just read the Amarna letters, you see, from this much earlier period than this. The Amarna letters are uh, written by the princes, written from Jerusalem, written by a king from Jerusalem to uh, Pharaoh Amenophis IV, asking for military aid and so forth. He's asking for him, but they refer in the in the Amarna letters uh, to constantly to the land of Jerusalem and various towns, to Bethlehem, which is in the land of Jerusalem. It's it. They always refer to the land of Jerusalem, well, the city state. Attica is the land of Athens. When you say Athens, what do you mean? You mean Attica. Athens and all the lands around it. When you say Sparta, you mean the same thing. But it's interesting that it specifically states this in the, in the Amarna letters, that that was the usage to talk about the land of Jerusalem and then the various towns in it. But he doesn't say he shall born, born at uh, Jerusalem, which is the city, in the city of Jerusalem. He didn't say that. He was born in the land of Jerusalem, which is where he was born. Jerusalem is just six miles south of uh, uh, Bethlehem is just six miles south of Jerusalem, and uh, it's, it's a suburb, and it's always been part of the land of Jerusalem, of course, the seat of, of David as well. She being a virgin, a precious chosen vessel, and conceived by the power of God. He will take upon him the pains and the sickness of his people. Now this is the mission, the atoning sacrifice. And he will take upon him death, that he may loose the bands, and it, that it may be fulfilled with mercy according to the flesh, that he may know according to the flesh how to succor his people according to their infirmities. It is his task. But notice here, uh, he could have done all this spiritually. After all, anyone with a sufficiently vivid imagination could have such an experience and go through with it. But here he must descend below all things. He would know exactly what it would be like, but that wasn't it. He must perform the thing himself, he says, he must go through it himself. Notice, take upon him death, that he may loose the bands of death, which bind his people. I don't doubt that he has other people everywhere, but when he comes down to deal with us, he takes on human flesh and goes through what we go through, you see. Descended be all, be, uh, below all things, he took on flesh that he, that he might redeem us. And so, go all the way and suffer more than we can, in the flesh, as flesh, this is the point. So that we never can say, oh yes, you were a God, it was divine, but you, you could just imagine it, it was done, or you could just snap your fingers and everybody, no, it isn't that way, it doesn't go that way, it says he. He may know according to the flesh how to succor his people according to their infirmities, that, that he may be filled with mercy, go all the way, you see, know exactly what we've been through. The Spirit knoweth all things, as far as that goes, I say, you didn't need to do that, but this was it. Nevertheless, he says, nevertheless, the Spirit knoweth all things. He could have handled that easily. Nevertheless, the Son of God suffereth according to the flesh, that he might take upon him the sins of the people, that he might blot out their transgressions according to the power of his deliverance. And now behold, this is the testimony which is in me. This is the power. He has the power given him to do this. See, because of sin, everything goes wrong. It cannot be corrected because we go right on sinning. You, see. you can't pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. We're in, in quicksand as far as that goes. The more you struggle, the deeper you'll get. You're not going to get out of it. You see, we're, we're not going to be able to redeem ourselves or anything like that. It, it's our nature to be, well, a carnal, sensual, and devilish, and that's all there is to it. This is a testimony. Now, what we do is repent, you see, which recognize, remember how Benjamin re re describes repent. Noth is held on knowing who you are, knowing what you are. When you know what you are, you will repent, and you'll become humble enough as far as that goes, you see. Uh, and he's going to talk about the, what goes right along with this, the two rules. The two rules from Delphi were know thyself and the nothing to the right or nothing to the left, nothing in excess. These two rules are given right here, in the, right in these verses here now. Repent, be born again. And be baptized, be washed from your sins, that you may have faith on the Lamb that taketh away the sins of the world. Going through the, the same imagery again. Lay aside every sin and show your God that you do repent by entering into a covenant to keep His commandments as a witness unto Him. 
This day, by going into the waters of baptism, of course, we witness after that that we're willing to take upon them the name of thy Son, keep his commandments which he has given them, and we witness it's the same thing we witness at baptism, isn't it? In the sacrament, when we partake of it, we, we renew it each time. You enter into a covenant and witness it and refresh it that way. We're using almost the same words here, witnessing unto him, but by water, but here it's by the sacrament. Whoever doth this and keeps the commandments shall have eternal life. And this is the object. This is what we're after. The, uh, we're going to find out that also everybody's going to have eternal life anyways. Like, they cannot die. We learn later on the, the resurrection has been taken care of. So what, we're, what are we so worried about eternal life? Well, if it's going to be eternal, the quality is going to be rather important, isn't it? Where you spend it and how you spend it has a great deal to say with it if it's going to be eternal. Yeah, the only question is, is it, you see, to go on living, but not go on living in the sewer. That's the difference. Well, do you believe these things, he asks you. Uh, notice, I said before, there's never been any dispute about the atonement. It's a very interesting thing, even among the doctors of the church, that word's never been debated. Do you believe these things? I know them. I know them by the Spirit, he says. I perceive you're in the path that leads to the kingdom of God. Now he comes to the other one. You see, this repent is to know yourself, and the other is nothing in excess, which is not, I say before, which is not just a rule for behavior. Uh, don't eat too much or drink too much or eat too little or drink too little. That's true. You must go. But the whole universe is sustained by a fine tuning. You see, the, the physicists call the, the, the 15... The 15 constants that must be finely tuned. I see the earth cannot be too far from the sun or too near from it. Just a little too much and there'd be no life. The sun cannot be too hot or too cold. It's raising the devil now, though, isn't it? Greater sun thoughts than have ever been. They've, they ha we have records of sunspots for over 400 years. Every sunspot's been recorded. Those that I used to go record them when I was a little kid. I made them all the time. It's very easy to do, you know. But. Uh, the largest protrusions and the largest sunspots ever seen are occurring on the sun now. So keep your hat on when you go out. I don't know. I wouldn't like to be on the shuttle right now. Uh, strange things happening now. Never, in 400 years, never happened like that before. It always comes and goes. And what's more, there are more sunspots appearing at one time than have ever appeared at one time before. That's going to look serious. Maybe the sun will wipe out on it. Well, we'll have a congressional committee and consult about what we'll do with the sun then, won't we? <laughs> That'll settle that. Well, but notice here's this, this fine tuning. Can't be too dry, it can't be too wet. See, parts of the earth are becoming desert now, and it's utter catastrophe. Other parts are becoming too wet. We know that, utter catastrophe. You must mark, as he says here, cannot walk in crooked paths, neither does he walk, vary from that which he has said. You can't vary. Neither are turning from the right to the left. Stay on the path. You don't go too far to the right. You don't go too far to the left. From that which is right to that which is wrong. Therefore, his course is one eternal round. See, it's, it's one round. And uh, it's, it's eternal. And it's, how can it be straight and round to the same? Well, I say straight is strict, staying on the course. And so, so the time will come when the filthy shall remain in filthiness. See, now... We must break with it while we can, he says, because this doesn't. This offer is not permanent. You see, this this will be changed, and you reach a point of no return, and then you have to settle for something lower, and you're going to have another kind of life after that. We do reach those those crisis points. The time shall come when those who are filthy shall remain in their filthiness. They're going to go to the right or the left, go too far to one side or the other. They'll stay there. They'll stick there. Now, the main thing. I want to awaken you to a duty, he said, that you will walk blameless before him, that you may walk after the holy order of God, after which ye have been received, specifically. And this is what he is. Now, again, you see, we talk about the specific sins, uh, and he named the specific sins. We just had them. But what about these virtues? What is it when you do right? What does doing right consist of? Now, he makes a specific list of them. You see, this is helpful here. I want to find this 23rd verse. Now, first, I would that you should be humble. Be submissive and gentle. Notice these aren't acts, these are states of mind. See, what makes a sin of sin is not what you do. What may be a virtuous one day can be a vice the next. Always amused me in, in Germany, this was before the war, uh, at all the city baths. Everybody would go to the city bath to bathe, you see, in this big bath. Thursday was family day. Everybody would go in. Well, no, they had no swimming suits or anything. They would just go in, you see. And uh, Thursday was family day, and everybody would go on together, and that was fine. It was sport and so forth. But any other day, 
if anybody of the opposite sex came in, they'd be arrested and taken to jail. It was terrible. It was obscene. But as long as it was Thursday, it was all right. Do the very same thing. Thursday is the ancient Scandinavian liver dogger. That's wash day. That's bathing day. And so all the families are bathed together on Thursday. But if you strayed into the wrong pool on a Friday or a Monday, I say, there'd be a scream and an uproar and you'd be hauled out of there. <laughs> an amazing thing. But it's just custom that does it here. But See, it's the state of mind that makes the difference, and it's here too. Well, as of course, only swaki mali pons, uh, to the pure, all things are pure, as Paul says. But here, to be humble, that's a condition, a state of mind, you see. To be submissive, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of patience and long-suffering, temperate in all things, diligent in keeping the commandments in all things. Here's a thing you must do, you are commanded to ask. That seems, we hesitate to ask as if we're too proud to ask and so forth, as if you go as a beggar and so forth. Well, it takes m more pride to uh, give than it does to ask. It's, it takes more humility. To give, you can, uh, a proud man can give, but a proud man won't ask, you see, this makes a difference. So, asking for whatsoever things you stand in need, spiritual and temporal, you have a perfect right to ask the Lord for what you need. Don't hesitate. Of course, in doing so, you'll look into yourself and ask yourself whether you deserve it or not, and it'll, it'll make you guilty, it'll bring you around to these other things. And always return thanks unto God for whatsoever things you do receive. And see that you have faith, hope, and charity. Now, these are the big three. Uh, you say, well, here's the Book of Mormon being lifted from the New Testament. No, it isn't. Uh, Richard Reitzenstein showed many years ago that the formula of faith, hope, and charity is a very ancient one. It's found very often, but not very often, but it is found in Hebrew writings, and it's a formula uh, found in the Hermetic writings quite commonly. Faith, hope, and charity. It's not limited to the New Testament at all. It's very ancient. They, these three go together. But notice what I notice here. Uh, I don't see in this list of virtues uh, hard work, thrift, drive, ambition, shrewdness, smarts. I don't see any of that at all. You find the same thing in Isaiah. The list of sins Isaiah lists are the things we consider virtues. The list of virtues Isaiah lists are the things we consider weaknesses and wimpishness. There's only a wimp would have all these things, diligent asking whatever you want. Notice you're always submissive. You do the asking, which you stand in need, always returning thanks, temperate. Sounds like Uriah Heep, except he was a hypocrite, you see. Diligent in keeping the commandments, patient and gentle and so forth. This is what God demands of us and, of course, what we don't give. And this is a very important theme of the Book of Mormon, always having charity. Have faith in charity, you do that, you see. Now may the peace of God rest upon you and upon your houses and lands. Uh, all things are blessed where the saints settle, as Brigham Young says. And now bless your houses and lands, your flocks and herds, and all that you possess, your women and your children, and so forth. So he leaves them and goes to another city. Now he goes to the city of Melech. This is a very interesting mission he has in the city of Melech. Notice, he says, have, see what he's doing, he's going around establishing the order of the church in all these places. It says here, having established the order of the church according as he had done in the land of Zarahemla. See, Zarahemla is the model. Zarahemla is just like the center stake of Zion. They're all organized on the pattern of Zarahemla here. He returned to his own house at Zarahemla to take a rest. Then he decides to go to the land of Melek. And look that one over on the uh, west of the riverside and see, you notice we're told that Sidon bounded Zarahemla on the east, so if he goes west to Melek on the other, on the Pacific coast side, and uh, which was the wilderness side too. It's always been the wilderness side. It still is. The wildest parts of Central America are all down the western side, you know. The eastern side is where all the populations are, the cities. And it's so in the Book of Mormon. According to the holy order of God, which has been called. And he went by the, see it was by the wilderness side. The west of the Sidon was by the wilderness side. And he baptized throughout all the land. And when he had finished his work at Melech, he departed three days' journey to the north. Now he's getting up there now, and he comes to Ammonahah, which is the wickedest city perhaps in the Book of Mormon. They're really wicked. They're worse than the Zoramites. And they're the ones that are utterly wiped out when the destruction comes. This Ammonahah. They were Nephites, notice. Custom of the people of Nephite to call their lands and their cities and their villages after the name of him who first possessed them. Just as we have. Uh, Brigham City, and we have Provo here. H.M. Uh, Provost, a French trapper, was the first man to settle and camp here. The man who settles it usually gets it named after him. And one of they were rough, they were hard hold people. Uh, Satan had got hold on their hearts, and they wouldn't hearken to Alma at all. 
Nevertheless, Alma labored with much spirit, wrestling with God in mighty prayer. Wrestling with God? Does God resist you? Do you have to resist him? No, you have to put yourself into position in the right state of mind. Remember, in our daily walks of life, as we go around doing things, uh, we're far removed. I mean, if you're bowling or if you're in business or uh, if you're jogging or something like that, the things you usually do, then you have to go from there to prayer. It's quite a transition, I say. It's like this culture shock. If you, if you really take it seriously and you have to get yourself in form, as I, like a wrestler, ha having to look around for a hold, get a grip and so forth, as, da as Jacob did when he wrestled with the Lord. You have to uh, size, size yourself up, I say. Take your, take your stance, circle the ring and so forth, and try to find out how you're going to deal with this particular problem. You're not wrestling with the Lord, you're wrestling with yourself. Remember, Enos was the one who really wrestled, and he tells us what he meant when he was wrestling. He was wrestling with himself, his own inadequacies. How can I possibly face the Lord in my condition, is what he says. You see. So this is what we're doing. Uh, the world, we operate on a different level. It takes great mental effort to confront the Lord in all seriousness. We do it at various shallow, shallow levels. We do it by routine. We have a prayer here because we we feel we should, we, we have to. Uh, if we're really going to make it really serious, we'd have to work on it harder, wouldn't we? We couldn't do it cold. In other words, you can't just come in cold and... Well, it's like a, an artist, uh, a cellist or a, a pianist. I have lots of relatives who are musicians. You can't just come in cold and begin a concert. Or even the tenor has to warble and so forth and get his voice ready. But you have to warm up your fingers. A cellist, my wife plays around, she has to warm up her instruments and her fingers, take at least 15 minutes to warm up. Then you're in the mood and then you have to take a while to think about it and then you're ready to go. Now if it comes to confronting the Lord, you have to be very serious about that sort of thing. It's quite a pre preliminary exercise which is called wrestling with the Lord, wrestling with yourself. He is at a distance. That's what you have to go through here, and very few people are willing to do it, but it, it, re it really pays off because you know exactly what you want and where you stand and so forth. Uh, but they won't have anything to do with him. These aren't dissenters. See, these people who have been living along by themselves, this religion, they broke off at an early time, and they've had their own religion for a long time. And what's more, there's evidence later in the Book of Mormon, they've been adopting some of the earlier religions that had been there too. And uh, we know who you are, all right, they say, notice in the 11th verse. Nevertheless, they say to him, no matter how hard he works, Behold, we know thou art Alma. We know that you're the high priest of the church. You have established many parts of the land, but we don't belong to your church, or we don't accept your foolish traditions. No, thank you. Very frank about it. They're very rude, as a matter of fact. They say, nothing is worse than a great man who's lost his clout. You see, and here it has. He says, you have no power over us. They go backwards to over, lean over backwards to insult him, because they know he has no power by the Constitution he himself agreed on, you see, that you could not use any religious compulsion on anyone. That's no power. You've given up the judgment seat, and you're not chief of the army anymore. You're not chief judge of us. So having lost his clout, what did they do? They reviled him. They spat on him. They caused that he should be ca They threw him out. The same thing happened to Samson and, and King Alfred and Ammon and King Lear after they, lo after they lost their office. It wasn't that they were just uh, retired to nothing. They were kicked around after that. Uh, people have always been waiting for the time when you would retire, you see, and when they could uh, tell you what they think of you. And this is what happens here. He has a rough time. He's very upset. His mission's failed here. Terrible anguish of soul, he says in the 14th verse. And he's weighed down. His heart is broken. He's going to go home. <laughs> he's going to leave. He's met by an angel, and the angel tells him to rejoice. I am the one from whom you received your first message, he says. Behold, I am he that delivered it unto you. That's an interesting thing. Remember, <coughs> in Luke, when the gospel is first being established, an angel goes around and visits various people, uh, namely Mary, and, uh, well, shepherds in the field, and, the, uh, and Zechariah in the temple and so forth. It's the same angel. It's Gabriel. He says, I'm Gabriel. Yeah, that was his particular mission, you see, to introduce that dispensation of time. And uh, obviously this this angel had, was assigned to Alma. He says, I'm the same one that visited you before, now here I am again. He's watching over Alma. We used to say much more about guardian angels uh, in the church. We used to teach much more of that dog. Always taught it to our kids and so forth. We don't do it anymore. I don't know why not, because it's a very real thing, the, uh, the presence of another world. Well, anyway, he, uh, the angel says, I'm the same one that visited you when you were a naughty boy. Remember me? Now I'm visiting you in another condition. You're the one who's sorry now, you see. He's, uh, 
the, uh, it's their wickedness that afflicts you now. I brought the first message. I am he that delivered it to you. Now you just return to the city of Amon Ha, just go right back and tell them they will repent or the Lord will destroy it. And he certainly did destroy it. And he entered the city and he was hungry. And he said to a man, will you give a humble servant of God something to eat? And the man said to him, I am a Nephite, and I know thou right. Notice, I am a Nephite. There were mixed races, there mixed blood there all over the place. He introduces himself as a Nephite. Though Amon is a Nephite city, they're not all Nephites in it, yes? I'm just curious, I know that your pronunciation of the city is different from that in the pronouncing guide. I was curious as to who made up the pronouncing guide, and That's does, right. it, does it claim to be a correct? Well, there are very, very, very strict rules to, to accenting uh, Hebrew and Arabic. They're unbreakable. But uh, this is an Egyptian name, both the Ammon and the Ha, you see. The, well, the, the Yahweh is the Yifa part, means Ammon is God. Of course, Ammon is the God of the empire. Ammon is by far the commonest name in the Book of Mormon, you see. But also it means the great God, the most high God, the hidden God, and all sorts of things. His name was used freely on both sides of the line. And Ammon Ha, that Ha, uh, Ammon I Ha, you think it? Well, the rule is, you see, in classics, the unbreakable rule is this. Always convert a Greek word into Latin, and then pronounce the Latin word as if it were English. But this doesn't necessarily apply to Semitic words necessarily, to Bible words. See. This would actually be Ammoniha, Ammoniha, if we were talking it in, telling it in English. Uh, Ammoniha, uh, it couldn't be, couldn't be Ammoniha in any Semitic language because the recessive accent doesn't go that far if you have double syllable, uh, double consonant in between. So Ammoniha is good enough. Uh, Who made the pronouncing guide? Oh, uh, committee up in Salt Lake. They sit around and make these things. No, they, I, I've been on it, and, and uh, it, it was fun. It was a million laughs, but uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> the way they go around and around about these things. It's a matter of taste, but remember, it's English we speak, and it's perfectly correct. Now, for example, uh, when. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Gregoire, who is the foremost authority on Byzantine history, uh, gave a class in Berkeley uh, in Byzantine history. He always would said Constantine. He would never say Constantine. That would be considered bad taste. If we say Constantine, he said Constantine because it's I-N-E. You pronounce it like English. And the English call it Constantine. Oh, we pronounce things quite differently there. Uh, you can call it Philo or Philo if you want. We call it Philo. But you know, we don't say Philadelphia. You don't say that. Uh, there are people that do, though. So, take your choice. You pays your money and you takes your choice. Eh? <laughs> Any way you want. Well, some, like Nephi, Nephi would be Nebpi. You notice they don't spell it with an F. It's just not an F, it's two separate letters. P I N. Nebhi means, my Lord is Nebhi. It means, my Lord is God, actually. And it's, it was an Egyptian name at the time of Lehi. And remember, Lehi's sons have Egyptian names, some of them. But the pronunciation, well, the, uh, we'll get on here now because this interesting thing is going to happen here in the city. This man, he says, I'm a Nephite. I know that you are a holy one of God. Uh, well, for example, uh, the Germans pronounce our, our Book of Mormon names very differently from that. Abinadi, which is perfectly natural with us, is Abinadi with them. They wouldn't recognize Abinadi in a million years. It's Abinadi, which is probably closer to the original key. Abinadi. Yes, sir. It means my, my God, Abi, my father has vowed. My father has. My God has vowed. Uh, my father has vowed. Abi is my father. Uh, and he says, I'm a Nephi, which points out some racial difference here. And I know thou art a holy prophet of God, because he's been visited by the same angel. See, Gabriel got around in the New Testament. This angel gets around here. Sorry, I didn't leave his name. Thou shalt receive, therefore, thou go to, come to my house. He told him about the situation. So he takes him to his house. And the man was called Amulek. And notice the, that they go very strong in the Milik words. It means property, it means possession, the basic root meaning. But then it means melek, means for king, it means to rule, to be power, uh, all sorts of... And you like the word Alexander, like the word Michael, it means to be, have power and uh, force. And he brought forth bread and meat and set before Alma. And Alma introduced him, and he said to Alma, I am Alma, and I am the high priest of the Church of God through the land. I've been called to preach the word of God. And Alma tarried many days at Alma, Amulek's house. 
And the people got worse and worse. They didn't repent. Well, they went around preaching, didn't do any good. And Alma went forth, and they went together, the 30th verse, Alma and Amnon joined forces and went together to declare the word of God unto them. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. And they had power given to them, insomuch that they could not be confined in dungeons, neither was it possible that any man could slay them. Neither did they exercise power until they were bound in bands and cast into prison. They got away with all sorts of things, but you know this often happens. Uh, one thing after another happens to some people, and uh, they get through with all sorts of things. Alexander the Great, for example. Incredible what he went through until he got drunk at a party, got a fever and so forth, was poisoned or something. Or Prince Eugene. Some people have been through untold battles without any scars at all. Or Porter Rockwell. He was shot at more than a, more than a, a duck in a shooting gallery, but he was never harmed. He was never scratched. There are such people, you know, that just go through, just, just walk right through. And this, this happens often, right? There's some fair stories about that. But uh, there are guardian angels. There are such a thing. Uh, we are being watched, you see. It's there. I have to think of another terrorist now. But they, could, but they were able to put them in jail just the same. They're cast into prison. The Lord might show forth his power in them. He let that happen. Now, Alma preaches to the people of Ammonah. This doesn't take us... This is what he preached to them. And... Uh, but Amulek's story is in the chapter after that. That's the amusing story. But first, Alma's, Alma's preaching to them. Well, he's preaching to the others. Is it the same old thing here? Well, it's different because they put up a fight. They argued back. They, they shouted back and forth. It turned out being a shouting match here. Alma began to preach to the people, and he says, As I began to preach unto them, and they began to contend with me, saying... See, they, it tells us above, you see. Now, this is Alma's own record here before. It was, uh, it was Moroni's record. And here, it's Alma's record. When I started, as he said, they, they said, You have no clout. We don't know who you are. He said, Who are you? Suppose that we shall believe the testimony of one man, though he should preach to us that the earth should pass away. We can't take it on your word alone. Now, here's a nice touch of tragic irony here. This is right out of Oedipus, isn't it? Where he says, Do you suppose we'll believe the testimony of one man when you preach to us that the, wor that the earth should pass away? Now, they understood not that the words which they spake, for they knew not that the, Lord, that the earth should pass away. You see, they were, they were pronouncing the doom on themselves. See, their city was buried completely. They're pronouncing it on themselves, as Oedipus says, even if he's somebody in my own house, I'll have revenge on him. Even if he's... Uh, the one who killed the, the old king. See, even if he, uh, and of course it was he himself, he was pronouncing the curse on him, and it's the same thing here. Uh, and, uh, there's something else I'm going to say, but anyway, uh, uh, that you should accept the testimony of one man that the earth should pass away. Well, it's the thing, it's the beginning of Oedipus. You see, it's, it's the prophet uh, it speaks to him. The prophet comes in the first, and uh, he prophesies what's going to happen, and he says, well, who's a single man? What's his prophecy worth? You see, it has to have a whole college of prophecy. They've just discovered a new, Engle a new Egyptian papyrus. I'm working on a fascinating thing in which the school of the prophets of Pharaoh do exactly as they did with Moses. Uh, they, there was a real prophet with great gifts, and they did everything they could to snow him under. They, they did everything they could to keep him from access to Pharaoh, because he would show them all up and so forth and how they plotted against him, how they kept... The main thing was to keep him low profile, keep him out in the country. Don't let anybody... He was very young, you see. Don't let anybody notice him. They did everything they could to damp his career, in other words. It's an amusing story and how all the, the great prophets at court, the, the magicians, the Hemnetcher, did that sort of thing. Well, anyway, they knew not that God could do marvelous works. For them, things just happen, you see. And if marvels do happen, are they without cause when something, we should, when something remarkable happens, and everything that remar is remarkable that happens, we should consult the causes and, and what is behind it. It does help us. Shouldn't we ask questions? Shouldn't we be curious about things? People aren't today. That's the thing we're not curious in this school. I was talking to a faculty member yesterday, and he says, the majors that he's teaching are not in the least bit curious about the subject they're supposed to be learning. It used to be that majors were completely absorbed in it and wouldn't do anything else. They'd go without eating and sleeping. They'd live on a dime a day. And anything, just they were so passionately involved in the subject. Today, it's a career, it's something you go through with. But, uh, and they said, who is God that he sent no more authority than one man, the lone dissenter is the main theme in the Book of Mormon, you know. That was Lehi, the lone dissenter, whether it's Lehi or Nephi or Alma or Ammon. 
or uh, Enos or whoever it is, who is God that sends no more authority than one man. Uh, what they want is big authority, uh, as if truth couldn't stand alone. He says, have you forgotten the tradition of your fathers? Don't you remember Lehi, if you want to know one man alone, what he did? One man alone? He does not answer that question. Why should we believe just one man? He, well, he gives them the case of Lehi there. But God has commanded you to repent or he will utterly destroy you. Now this was to be a test case in the model, this city here. And here is the rule that's given again. Inasmuch as you shall keep my commandments, you shall prosper in the land. Inasmuch as you shall not keep my commandments, you shall be cut off from the presence of the Lord. Now, all the promises in the, are given with the curse, as you know, in the Book of Mormon, as in the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's the Baracha, the blessing is, but never without the Kalala. The Kalala is the cursing, the Baracha is the blessing. The two fit right together, and they do all through the Book of Mormon. It's the condition. You don't enter a very profitable contract without a penalty clause. If you flaunt the contract and break the rules and so forth, you're not, well, you're, you're off, you're released then because you broke the contract. Oh no, you have to pay a penalty for that. You go to jail for that or something else. The Lamanites have not kept the commandments and they have been cut off. There are many, but then he talks about the Lamanites here. He says, there's still a chance for you, the Lamanites, there's a chance for the Lamanites, there'll be one for you too. But there are many promises which are extended to the Lamanites, but it is because of the traditions of their fathers that caused them to remain in ignorance. The, uh, the Lord will be merciful to them and prolong their existence in the land because they're not afraid. This, this offer occurs and the, uh, the same, well, he says here, at some period of time, they will be brought to believe in his words, and many of them will be saved. And this is the prophecy for the, for the Lamanites, because their fathers are to blame more than anything. But not with you, he says, 18th verse here. Your days shall not be prolonged in the land, for the Lamanites shall be sent upon you. He's going to turn the table. These are supposedly the good Nephites he was talking to. Shall be sent upon you, and you shall be visited with utter destruction. There's the reverse, because you've had the greater privilege. He would rather suffer that the Lamanites might destroy all his people who were called the people of Nephi. Just, remember, it's just a designation. If it were possible that they should fall into sin and transgression, after they having so much light and so much knowledge, he would prefer to have the Lamanites destroy them utterly if they don't remain true and faithful. So, we should envy the Russians here, he says, after having been such so highly favored people, after having been favored above every other nation, kindred, tongue, or people, after having all things made known unto them, and so forth, if that happens, you're much worse off than anybody else, of course. Having been visited by the Spirit of God, the 21st, having conversed with angels, having been spoken to by the voice of the Lord, having the spirit of prophecy, all these things, and revelations, and gifts, and speaking of tongues, and preaching, and the Holy Ghost, Ghost, and the gift of translation. Now, after, he keeps repeating after again, notice a very powerful orator is Alma. After having been delivered of God out of the land of Jerusalem, there it is again, the land of Jerusalem, not the city of Jerusalem. Remember, their house was in the land of Jerusalem, too. There, their country house, the land of their inheritance, was in the land of Jerusalem. From the land of Jerusalem, having been saved from famine and sickness, all the things you've gone through now, 23rd, now if this people have received so many blessings, should transgress contrary the light and knowledge which they do have, I say unto you, if this be the case, if they should fall into transgression, it would be far more tolerable for the Lamanites than for them, you see. The Book of Mormon rubs this in too much. It must have something for us. It must be saying something to us. I'm, I can't get away from that. For behold, the promises of the Lord are extended to the Lamanites, but they are not extended to you if you transgress. Notice, they're extended to the Lamanites unconditionally, but they're not extended to you if you transgress. For has not the Lord expressly promised and firmly decreed that if you rebel against him, you will be utterly destroyed? Can't make it strong enough, you see. This is the promise on the land. Now, for this cause, that you may not be destroyed, the Lord has sent his angel and many of his people. See, he said again, an angel always comes in a great crisis to turn things around. When everything is going rush. It's, this city is in decay, out of control, you see. The only thing that can turn things around is the appearance of an angel, and he does, just as he turned Alma around when he was a young man. And here it is, expressly promise that you be not destroyed, so the Lord has an angel to visit you, many of his people declaring unto you. So this is a mighty angel flying. This is what the angel Moroni had to preach. It was this. 
And so Moroni, that was Moroni, he's the man who wrote this book. He's the one, and what is he doing? He's warning us all over the place. The one on the Salt Lake Temple, you know. You may have seen him. And they're threatened with this. Well, would we welcome this? Not many days hence the Son of God shall come in His glory, and His glory shall be the glory of the only begotten Father, full of grace and equity and truth, full of patience, mercy, and long-suffering, quick to hear the cries of people and to answer their prayers. Notice, the, uh, He cometh to redeem those who will be baptized unto repentance through faith on His name. And membership levels are not the decisive factors. The time is at hand when all men shall reap a reward for their works, whether you belong to the church or not, when all men shall reap a reward. If you've been righteous, notice there's just two conditions. If you've been righteous, and he's told us what righteousness is, he just said, as the Lord, grace, equity, truth, patience, mercy, long-suffering, these are the characters that the Lord has shown us. And if you're righteous, they'll reap the salvation to their souls. But if they've been evil, no. Bring forth works meet for repentance, he says. Ye are a lost and fallen people, he tells them in the 30th verse. This is the last call, you see. And we don't like it either. Were the people satisfied with this? This made them mad as hornets. The next verse tells them, we're on 31 now. When he, when he tells them, come, frankly, he ends up by saying, Ye are a lost and fallen people. When I am, I spoke in these words, behold, the people were wroth with me, because I said unto them, they were hard-hearted and stiff-necked people. So then Amulek stands forth, and he begin, begins to preach to them. Amulek preached to them, and he introduces himself a very striking character. I mean, these vignettes, these character sketches in the Book of Mormon, very clearly marked. This is the most respected citizen you could possibly imagine. He is a, of the... He's a blue blood. He, I am Amulek, a descendant of Aminadi. Aminadi, and uh, this is... Uh, and Aminadi was a descendant of Nephi. He's proud of his genealogy who was the son of Lehi. And here we have an extremely important genealogical note, don't we? Nehi was a descendant of Manasseh, who was half Egyptian, and Egyptian, his mother was Egyptus, it was not Egyptus, his mother was, was uh, Asenath, who was of the blood of Ham, who was a pure Egyptian. She had to be, her father was the high priest of Heliopolis, was a descendant of Manasseh, and his twin brother was, uh, was Joseph, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh, you'll get it right, uh, was Ephraim, from whom we pretend that we are descended, we pretend we are descended from him, who was the son of Manasseh, the Egy of Asenath, the Egyptian woman. I should be writing on the voice when I get myself all mixed up here. And who was the son of Joseph, who was sold into Egypt by the hands of his brethren. And of course, here, the blood of, they have the blood of Egypt in them. They have the blood of all the 12 tribes from Joseph and Manasseh, you see. And they have about everything you can imagine in the mixed blood of Egypt. You've seen that before. And notice he says, besides his distinguished birth background, behind being, I'm a man of no small reputation. It's a great reputation in hand. He, he's well known and highly respected. I've also acquired much riches by the hand of my industry. He's been a successful businessman and made himself very rich. He's been very successful, very respected, and uh, he is the creme de la creme. Nevertheless, I've never known much of the ways of the Lord. He says, well, he was born in the church. He knew about the gospel. But uh, how come? What's happening here? Well, of course, here we have the... Here we have the, uh, the parable of the sowers, the seed that follows, and the cares of the world will make them so busy after they've accepted the gospel that they get lost and drop it. So he says here, I've never known much of the Lord and of his mysterious and marvelous power. I have seen much of his mysteries and his marvelous power, yea, even the preservation of the lives of this people. Nevertheless, I did harden my heart. <laughs> was too busy getting rich, apparently. He wouldn't listen to it. I was called many times, and I would not hear. Something was distracting him, obviously, he says. I have known much, because he says he has gained much riches by his industry. Well, his industry was distracting him, of course. He had hardened my heart, I would not hear. I knew concerning these things, yet I would not know. This is the case of so many people, see, so many. Yet I would not know. Is, um, I went on rebelling against God in wickedness until I was journeying along and this angel came, stopped him. See, he would have gone all the way, too. An angel of the Lord. Uh, with the Book of Mormon, the, the gap is crossed by the angel again, as he did in Moroni 7:29, etc. It's the angel that gets us off dead center when we're stuck that way, but only on great occasion, you see. And I know he's a holy man because it was said by an angel of God, how he was introduced to Alma and so forth. 
And now Amalek has spoken these words to the people again, they began to be astonished. Well, we may ask, incidentally, uh, this uh, role model, well, we'll see what they do. They all turn against him. Of course they do. Began to be astonished, seeing that he was such a respectable person, and so forth. So, the time is up now. The people turned against him as they had turned against Alma and insulted him and so forth. But you'd say, but surely they're going to they're rough him up here, notice. They try to uh, ch uh, trip him up with the cunning of their words and the, the judges delivered them to the judges of the law, send them to prison according to the crime which they could make appear and witness against. They're going to frame him. They're going to be framed. They're going to send him to jail. Everybody turns against him and say, ah, but the rich man of good family, surely his relatives and family would not turn against him. Well, come again. If you turn to Alma 15:16, where we have him way along here. Hmm. We're still talking about... Uh, Yes, here's Amulek. Came to pass that Alma and Amulek, Amulek having been forsake, having forsaken all his gold, ah, he's not rich anymore. Just as Alma wasn't powerful anymore, so they said, you've lost your cloud and made fun of him. As soon as he got rid of his money, what happens then? Story of, uh, of time of Athens, isn't it? Amulek having forsaken all his gold and silver and his precious things which were in the land of Ammonaha for the word of God, he being rejected by those who were once his friends and also by his father and his kindred. Not only his friends reject him, but he's lost his money, his own family, his father, and his kindred will have nothing to do with him because he's got, lost his money, not because he's preaching the gospel. You know, marvelous psychological insights from the Book of Mormon, but I see the time is up now. And uh, we'll continue with this scandal. Go hence and have more talk of these sad things.